Hello everyone, this will be our circus analysis uh, workshop and so today I'm going to be going over how we actually analyze and use circuits. And so this is important fundamental for uh, the courses you'll see in the rest of electrical engineering, so we're going to be going over some of the basics. And so to start out, I'm going to cover over when we can actually use electric circuit theory and when we can't. So electric circuit theory, it provides a simple understanding of a circuit. And so uh, basically it deals with a lump parameter system. You're probably wondering what that is. And a lump parameter system is when we shrink the components to uh, zero. So uh, we make it very small for those. And you'll see what I mean when we go later on. So we don't take everything into account. So let me make that a little larger for you guys to notice. So electric circuit theory, it's basically when the size of our circuit, so I'm going to say S, is less than or equal to, and then the wavelength divided by 10. And so that's when we can use electric circuit theory, when the size of the circuit, so I'm going to show you guys, the size refers to the diagonal. And so that's the size of the circuit. And then it's less than or equal to the wavelength divided by 10. And a lot of the times you'll notice the wavelength, what we like to use is the value uh, for the speed of light. And if you guys remember the speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And uh, just remember, uh, when we do the speed of light, you have to recall the equation C is equal to F times lambda, which is the wavelength. And when we plug it in then, for the value of C, you just have to divide by the frequency given in the equation. And so electric circuit theory is nice because basically, we don't have to take into account like all the weird magnetic fields and everything else. However, if you can't use electric circuit theory, that's when you have to use the other theorem. And the other theorem, so you guys know, is electromagnetic uh, theory. In the electromagnetic theory, you'll learn in physics 152 deals with Maxwell's equations. And basically, this is distributed parameters. And distributed parameters means that the components take up space. And so uh, with Maxwell's theory, you'll have to run into those four equations and they'll talk about the time varying magnetic field, the time varying electric field and what those will do. But most of the time you guys will stick with electric circuit theory for the entire course. You'll go a little into electromagnetic theory in EE360. Okay, now that I covered that, I'm going to talk now about the basics. So you guys need to know what current is. And so I'm going to define that for you guys. So current, if you want to know, it basically means that charges are moving. And I like to see a little diagram with this. So if you think about your electron, looks something like this. It's moving, so it's going to the right. So that's current. How much charge is basically moving per uh, unit time? And so what we define it as, so you guys know, the equation for current is charge, which is with a capital I, is dq divided by dt. dq, so you know charge, is measured in coulombs. So charge is in coulombs, time is in seconds. And so that's how we define current. It's the amount of charges that are moving per unit time. Now that we talked about that, we're going to go a little into voltage. And voltage, so you guys know, voltage is basically charges are separated. And what I mean by that is uh, what I like to see a lot of times is I think of a capacitor plate in order to know that charges are separated. And you'll have like all your electrons on one side of the capacitor. And then on the other side, you'll have your protons. And so how I like to think of it is that there is a voltage because there's a separation of charge. All the negative charges are on this side and all the positive charges are on this side. And so that separation of charge, since they uh, cannot jump and combine uh, to make a neutral charge, 
uh, that is what I call voltage. So what we define it as in the equation form is voltage is the amount of work per unit charge. And you're probably wondering work, that's in units of joules and work is energy. So that's the uh, notation we use. And then charge, like I said, that's measured in coulombs. You'll learn that an electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs in physics 152. And now that we learned about voltage, the last major one is power. And so you guys know what power is. It's a little different. Uh, it's a combination of the two is what I like to think of it. So power, we can write it as I times V. And when I do this, in order to help me think of what the equation is, we know current is dQ dt. So the amount of charge per unit time and voltage is the amount of work per unit charge. So dW, dQ. And since we know those, look at how the units cancels, how I think of it. So power equals, and then on the numerator here, we have charge, which is measured in coulombs, and then the denominators in seconds. And then we multiply it by uh, joules here, and then charge is in the denominator here. So then I have C. And so what I get basically is joules per second. And you guys will notice this. So joules per second, that's what you get because the coulombs cancel, as you'll notice right here in the numerator and denominator. And we know energy is measured in joules. So this is work and then per unit time, uh, basically. So it's the amount of work per unit time is power. So that's how you look at it this way. So you can write it as dW dt. And those are the basics you guys need to know, these equations here. You need to know current is amount of charge per unit time. So think of how many of these electrons are moving through um, a certain section. So like how many are coming in to the section area. And then voltage is amount of work per unit charge. So what I like to think of that is for the capacitor with the charges separated. Power is the amount of work per unit time. So how much um, work is being uh, actually utilized. And now that we talked about all those, I want to talk a little difference between passive and active circuit elements. You'll encounter passive elements all in EE um, 211, but you'll encounter all active circuit elements in EE 330. And so there's a big difference between the two. And so I'm going to get a little into that so you guys have a more intuition behind it. And so for the first one, what is a passive circuit element? Well, passive circuit element, it basically, um, what we have, it converts or stores electrical energy. And a few examples of these are resistors, inductors, and capacitors. And so uh, we know going from here is the passive circuit elements, if we think about it, uh, I just like to use symbols a lot of times. We have a resistor, we have an inductor, and we have a capacitor. They have nice uh, linear relationships a lot of the time. So you'll be dealing with Ohm's law. And then the other types so you guys know are active circuit elements. So there's a difference between the two. Active circuit elements, you'll see a lot of times, they provide energy to other circuit elements. and or controls the exchange of energy source of electrical energy controllers. And the main examples you'll see are the BJTs, MOSFETs, and vacuum tubes. These are highly used, so you guys know, uh, as transistors a lot of the times, so the BJTs and MOSFETs, you have your diodes. So what an active circuit element looks like, just so you get used to the symbols, don't worry if you don't understand what those are right now, 
is usually they are, um, they have three external pins. So for the BJTs, it's the base collector and emitter. And for the MOSFETs, it's the source drain and gate. But uh, what you guys just need to know for 211 is the passive circuit elements. And that contains uh, basically linear relationships. And so how we think of this um, when I'm like, is it passive or is it active? I'm like, okay, passive, it stores electrical energy. Uh, that's what a capacitor does. It stores charge on its plates. And um, we can also think the resistor, uh, it gives off heat uh, when it goes through it. And then we also have our inductor. An inductor, so you guys know, it has a current running through it. And with a current running through this inductor, I like to think of it, uh, you'll learn this in physics 152, current is with your thumb. And then the magnetic field is when you curl your fingers. So say the current's going upwards here, look at my camera. The magnetic field lines are when I basically um, pull in my fingers. So that tells you the direction. So if the current's going to the right, well, the magnetic field, it's going to be curling around. And so I'm gonna draw it, um, looking like this here, I'll try to do my best. It's gonna be coming around and that's our magnetic field. And uh, ma a time varying magnetic field induces a voltage. And so that's what you guys will learn later on. But just so you know, the main difference between the two is passive circuit elements can convert or store electrical energy. And they're usually the R, um, ICs, resistors, inductors, capacitors. And then the active circuit elements provide energy to the rest of the circuit. And so those are the big main differences because the transistor, it can control um, if the rest of the circuit gets energy or not. And so if you have a light bulb, let's say on this side of the circuit, and you have like a voltage source over here, that transistor is responsible for allowing basically this current to run to the bulb so it can turn on and be bright. And so you have to either put a current in, if it's a BJT, it's current controlled, or if it's a MOSFET, it is voltage uh, dependent. So you have to apply a voltage to it. And you'll learn that later. Uh, I'm just giving you a little intro on that. So now that we talked about passive and active elements, I'm going to get into what is a circuit element? How can we define one? So I'm going to erase what I have here. I see there's, um, yes, I will post this one on YouTube. So what is a basic circuit element? Because we see resistors, capacitors, inductors. You're probably wondering how in the world, like, what does this actually do? And so for a basic circuit element, I'm going to define it here. A circuit element uh, has two terminals. So it has an input and output. So uh, let me show you real quick. If I have a resistor here, I have an input. So the current, if it's running for the resistor, there's, it's going to go through and it's going to come out of the resistor. So input and output. Okay, my next one is a circuit element cannot be subdivided. So that means you cannot break this resistor down. Um, it's basically um, in its shape. You can't try breaking it uh, because it's at a fixed resistance value. You can't break it into like multiple resistors. So uh, that's another part. You can't divide these elements, their whole. And then the third one is you can write uh, the current or voltage as a function going in mathematically. So I can write here the current as a function of voltage, or I can write the voltage as a function of current. And so that's what I mean by you can write the current or voltage mathematically. And so we can write, uh, let's say there is a voltage drop across this resistor. So a plus and minus for a voltage drop. And the current going through, let's say the voltage drop was like uh, 10 volts or something. And so I could write the current is equal to a function of the voltage drop, which is 10 volts. 
And then uh, for the voltage here, I can write it as a function of current. So let's say the current is something like 10 milliamps or something. That's where I could plug it in here and then uh, write it as a function of current. And so that's what um, basic circuit elements, the three ideas they have to follow. OK, a big um, concept you guys need to understand is passive sign convention. I'm going to get a little into this. Uh, I'm going to make sure you guys know it by heart because um, Ari will teach it to you. OK, passive sign convention. What it does is basically if positive charge moves down a voltage drop, the, then power is positive. So I'll say P for power is greater than zero in that circuit element. OK, so positive charge, you're probably wondering what that is. That means current. So I'm going to draw this out for you because diagrams help me a lot of the time. So I'm going to have a voltage source here. And so this voltage source, it's going to have a resistor here. And how I'm going to show you guys is the current, which is coming through the positive terminal out of it. I'm going to label it I. And so um, our resistor here has a positive and a negative on here uh, for its specific polarity. And so the current's going to be going down uh, from the positive to negative. So that means it's a voltage drop from a higher potential to a lower potential. And so when this current comes down here, the charge, so the current moves down a voltage drop, so the power is positive here. So the power is positive. However, when that current is still coming through the circuit, so after it goes through the resistor, you'll see here it's going to go through in the negative terminal first to the positive terminal. That's a voltage rise. You're going from a lower potential, so think of the level up to a higher potential. So that's a voltage rise. And so the current, uh, when it goes up a voltage rise, that means the power is negative. So I'm going to say power is less than zero here. And that's um, the basis behind pass the sign convention. What you guys need to know is if current's going down a voltage drop, it's positive power. If current's going down a voltage rise, it's negative power. And the big rule of thumb um, is that sources, when you only have like one independent source, so I'll make a note, independent source, um, the source generates power. So it is negative because it delivers. So generate slash delivers power to the circuit, where um, the circuit elements, so all the resistors, everything, so the circuit elements other than the source, what they do in the circuit is they uh, absorb power. And so those circuit elements, when they absorb power, uh, that's going to be a positive power they give off. Like this resistor here, we saw it gave off a positive power rating. And now that we talked about that convention, we're going to get a little into um, common terms uh, you'll see when you have to do problems. And first, I'm going to talk a little about um, finding total charge. And so this is going to be a little where mathematics comes in, so you guys know. So if I want to find total charge, I'm going to do this in a different color. Find total charge. What that means is I have to use charge we know. Um, what we want here is uh, Q, and Q stands for charge, so we know like I said in the beginning, the current is equal to the amount of charge per unit time. So when I say find the total charge, I want Q. So what we do here is we multiply by dt in order to solve for Q. So I dt equals dq. 
And this is where your mathematic skills comes in, is you're going to take the integral of both sides. So when you take the integral of both sides, you're going to get Q on this side. So that's total charge is equal to. And then think about the integral of I dt. Um, what that will give you, uh, we don't have bounds on here, but um, if you were to, it would be like I squared over two. I'm just gonna leave it the way it is. So just say I dt because it depends on what your bounds are here. But that's the equation in order to find total charge. Don't memorize it, just memorize that current is equal to the amount of charge per unit time. And what you need to do is just solve for Q. So do your little mathematical operations here. Okay, now that I talked about that, another big one you're going to see uh, that's going to ask you for in your circuits is it's going to ask, what's the max value of the current? And so you're probably like, oh, max value? Max value, what should be happening in your head is you should be thinking the first derivative because the first derivative gives you your uh, maximum or minimum. Um, and so what you need to think is the max value is when the first derivative is equal to zero. And so what we need to do is we're going to have our di dt set equal to zero when we want to find the max value of current. So remember, current is um, given by the character i. So we're going to take the derivative with respect to time and set it equal to zero. So that's how you guys find the max value of current. And now to do the max value of power, remember, max value is the first derivative. So the max value of power, that's when you do dp dt is equal to zero. Because we know power is in p, uh, so we just take it with respect to time and do equal to zero. And then uh, when it asks you to find the total energy, we know when you uh, need energy, energy is in units of joules, and we know work is energy. And so what we do is, I told you guys a little earlier on, is that power is equal to dw dt for amount of work per unit time. And so we use our mathematical skills. What you need to do is multiply by dt here. So you get p dt equals dw. And when you then take the integral of both sides here, you're going to get w is equal to, and then I'm just going to leave it as an integral because it depends on your bounds, the integral of p dt. And um, now that we talked about that, I'm going to get into um, what a node is in Kirchhoff's current and voltage laws, because that's a lot of what you're going to see in the first few chapters here. And so let me write down basic circuit definitions as well and give you a few uh, visuals on it. So now that we talked about all the common uh, types, what they might ask you to find for the total, a node, what that stands for is it's a point where two or more circuit elements meet. And so let's say if I have a resistor here and I have a resistor here, they're both circuit elements. And so the point where they meet here, that's a node. So that's what I define it as. And then uh, the next one is going to be Kirchhoff's current law. And so that's the algebraic sum of all the currents at any node equals zero. Okay, I find that like way too many words. I just memorized the current going in is equal to the current going out. Make it simple for once teachers. Okay, so <laughs> that's what I like to think of Kirchhoff's current law. So um, at a node, let me just show you guys. We have a resistor here, a resistor here, and a resistor here. And this is our node. The current going in, let's just say the current is coming in here, is equal to the current coming out. So let's just say that's the current, the arrows in the opposite direction. 
Now I'm going to label this uh, I1 here, I2, and I3. And so if I were to write a Kirchhoff's current law for this equation, it would be I1 plus I2 is equal to the current coming out, I3. And that's due to the direction of the arrows. We have I1 coming into the node, I2 coming in, and I3 going out. Okay, now we're going to do Kirchhoff's voltage law. Kirchhoff's voltage law, it says the algebraic sum of all the voltage drops in a closed loop equals zero. And so uh, what that looks like is basically if we have a voltage source here, what I like to think of it is the source is equal to everything, uh, all the other elements in the circuit. And so we have a resistor here, a resistor here, and resistor here. Uh, the voltage at the source, I'll label it here. I'll label this V1 for the voltage across the first resistor, the voltage across the second resistor, and the voltage across the third resistor. So the voltage law says all the voltage drops in a closed loop must be equal to zero. So I think of it as the source voltage is equal to, and so the voltage supplied is equal to all the voltage dropped across the rest of the circuit elements. So V source is equal to V1 plus V2 plus V3. So you start with your source and you say it's equal to all the other voltage drops in the circuit. Okay, now that we talked about that, we're gonna talk about series versus parallel circuits. So let me get into that. And uh, what you guys will need to know is the main difference between these two is how, uh, what they share and what they don't share. And so series circuits, uh, in a series circuit, it's the same value of current within the circuit. And they share one node, whereas parallel, circuits, it's the same value of voltage across um, parallel elements. And then they share um, two nodes. So uh, they meet at the top and bottom. So I'm going to draw this out for you guys so you know what it means. Uh, for a series circuit, I'm going to have right here my voltage source, and I'm going to have a resistor here and a resistor here. As you can see, resistor one, so I'm going to mark that one and this one two, share one node here. So they're in series with each other. Here, for parallel circuits, I'm going to draw it. And we'll see, I'm going to have the first resistor and the second resistor. And I'll label this one one, two. These share two nodes right here and right here. They're both, uh, from the beginning to end, they share the same two nodes. And so we can say the special part about this is the current in a series circuit is the same where the voltage drop across two uh, parallel elements is the same in a parallel circuit. So this voltage drop here is equal to the voltage drop here. Okay, now that we talked about that, um, Sometimes you have to do combinations of the two and you have to analyze it. So just look, uh, my biggest tips when you have to solve is start furthest from the source. So uh, you'd start on the rightmost and then you would find the resistors, uh, see if they share one or two nodes that will determine if they're in series or if they're in parallel and then combine all the resistors to one equivalent resistor. And then uh, you solve for the current, and then you can go backwards from the source and solve the rest of the circuit. But for beginners purposes, just know the main difference between the two. And now we're going to talk about voltage division versus current division. Okay, so let me just clear everything here, because voltage division and current division are going to be a huge topic. Uh, I personally enjoy current division. Some people like voltage division. Voltage division is used for a series circuit most of the times. And so then you have, um, let me just set up the equations and then I'll get into how you actually solve them. 
So I'm going to have on this side voltage division, and on this side here, I'm going to have current division. And so current divisions are used in parallel circuits. And um, what that equation looks like is it is, let me change all this. The current uh, coming in is the current source. Which are, There we go. So here's what I want to tell you guys. The difference between the two is for voltage division, it's the uh, element that you want to find the voltage across is equal to the voltage provided by the source times the resistance of the element you want to find the voltage across divided by the entire resistance in the circuit. Current division is equal to the current of uh, what you want to find the current going through that element is equal to the current provided by the source times the resistor you're not interested in, all divided by the resistor you're not interested in and the rest of the equivalent um, resistance in the circuit. And so that's how you're going to memorize these two equations is what I like to think is it's always the source. And for voltage division, it's the one uh, element you're interested in over the equivalence of the rest. Well, current divisions, the opposite, it's what you're not interested in over the not interested in plus the rest of the resistance. And so I'm going to give you an example of what these look like. So let's say here I have my current source, uh, sorry, voltage source, because um, in the circuit, and it's going to be in series, we're going to have two resistors here. And so for this first resistance value, I'm going to give it a value of 10 ohms here for resistor one. And for resistor two, I'm going to give it a value 20 ohms. And if we want to find the voltage across resistor two, um, what the rest I need to label is at the source, let's say, three volts. So if I want to find the voltage across resistor two, I'm going to say V of two. So uh, that's the one we want to find. End is what we want to find. So the voltage across two is going to equal the voltage provided by the source, which is three volts times the resistor we're interested in because ends what you're interested in. So this would be 20 ohms divided by the equivalent resistance. And so the equivalent resistance of the circuit is 10 plus 20, so that's 30 ohms. And we'll see here, what we get for the voltage across this resistor is going to be equal to three times two thirds. Two thirds of three is two volts. And so right here, we're going to have two volts. So I'm gonna label two volts across this resistor. So that must mean this one only has one volt because the um, voltage coming from the supply is gonna be equal to the voltage drop across the rest of the circuit elements. Okay. Now I'm gonna talk about current division. So uh, current division is a little different. So you guys know current division is uh, when you have a parallel circuit. So that one, I'm going to show you guys with our current source here. And the current source, we're gonna have one resistor here and another resistor here. What's going to happen is we'll just label this resistor one again and give it the same value of 10 ohms. This one's going to be a resistor two, and we're going to give it the same value of 20 ohms. And so uh, what we want to think of is the current we're interested in. So let's say we want to find this current going through the 10 ohms. So I'm going to label this I1. I'm going to label this one here I2. And we know the current coming through the source um, provided by the current source. So I of S, because through the current source, the current's coming out. So I of S here is going to be um, when we solve. So if we want to find the current going for the 10 ohm, that would be the current uh, one is equal to the current provided by the source. Here, I'm going to just say it's two amps. So I'm going to write in here two amps. And then the resistor we're not interested in. So we're interested in this 10 ohm. So we're not interested in the 20 ohm. So it's going to be the 20 ohm all over the resistor you're not interested in. 
which is the 20 ohm plus the rest of the uh, resistance in the circuit. And so the rest of the resistance in the circuit here is 10 ohms. And when you do that, what you're going to get is 2 thirds times 2 amps. And when you do 2 amps times 2 thirds, what you're going to get is 4 thirds. And that should be about 1.3 amps. So we should say the current going through that 10 ohm resistor is going to be 1.33 amps. And we can just put a bar over that because it repeats. So that must mean the current going through I2. Since we know Kirchhoff's current law, which says the current coming in is equal to the current going out, this must be equal to 0.66 amps. Since I1 is equal to uh, 1.33 here, and we know two amps is provided by the source. So that two amp source coming in is going to be equal to the current coming out of that node. Okay, now that we talked about that, I'm going to get a little into um, the next part. And for the next part here, I'm going to be talking about the um, delta Y transformation. And you guys will see this probably once and then that's it. But it's important to know uh, for power, at least, purposes. So that's why I want to cover it. And so what it looks like is delta. If you think of that, what comes to mind is the delta symbol in Y looks something like this. So we start out with a delta. You're going to have the shape, but you have a resistor between each of these nodes here. And I'm going to call this resistor C, resistor B, and resistor A. And then I'm just going to label this A. And then we have B across from resistor B and C across from resistor C. And then the Y version of this is going to look something like this, where we have the A, we have a resistor. And then we're going to have the point B. And then we're going to have the point C. So we have A, B, C. And the resistors here, I'm going to call this resistor 1, resistor 2, and resistor 3. And what I like to think of it is it's so much easier just to know that you can sort of redraw it within the delta. And so you can draw that Y formation in there so you know where to put the A, B, and C on here so the points match up. And so um, now that I talked about that, there's certain equations you guys need to memorize. And uh, these, don't worry, Dr. Ari never tested it on it. He said you only use this once or twice, so um, you might not need to know. It depends on the class you're in. But the delta to y conversions, so you guys know. So if we go from delta to y, the ones that you're going to know is there's a little trick to it, is R1 here. If you look inside the diagram where this is R1, this leftmost uh, in the upper left, it's going to be equal to the two resistors touching that point A, so which is RB and RC. So the product of them, so RB times RC, all over. And then it's going to be all the resistors summed together. So RA plus RB plus RC. And then for the next one, we're going to want to know R2. Well, it's the exact same thing, you guys. The two resistors that are touching R2, which point is B here, is RA and RC are touching point B. And so then it's RA times RC all over the sum of them, which is RA plus RB plus RC. And now that we talked about that, we're going to get into the last one, which is R3. R3 here is going to have the endpoint C in RA and RB touch C. And so if we write it here, R3 is going to be equal to RA times RB all over the sum of them, which is R1 plus R2 plus R3. Now that we discussed that, 
and finish with um, the delta to y conversions, you need to know how to translate it back over from y to delta. And so y to delta, in order to do that, what you guys need to do is there's a different set of equations. And so this would be RA. It's sort of like the inverse to me. It's everything summed on top. And if you sort of think of it, you're just going from one to the other. So do the inverse operation. So this one's R1, R2 plus R2, R3 plus R3, R1. And I'll show you how to get those. And then it's all over R1. And so if you look at RA here uh, in the diagram, R1 is the one opposite of it. And so we have it here. And we can see right here RA uh, where R1 is, it's located opposite on this diagram. And so um, R1 touches point A, you can also think of it that way. And so what we do is we basically take uh, the product of the two resistors. So we do R1 times R2, R2 times R3, R3 times R1. And so you just take the product of each, you just go R1 times R2, and then R2 times R3, then R3 times R1. And then you just divide it by uh, the one resistor um, that touches point A, which is resistor one. Resistor B is the exact same thing you do. Uh, so this numerator here, exactly the same, and you divide it by. And if we look RB, what's touching it is resistor two. And then RC, it's the exact same thing for the numerator. And then which resistor is touching RC? Um, so point C, it's R3. So that'd be your denominator. So that's how you convert uh, between the two. Um, so you know how to go from delta to y and y to delta. Okay, now that we talked about that, I'm going to get just a little into um, node voltage and mesh current because that's the most important things you're going to see next. And so uh, what node voltage is, is basically you're going to find the essential nodes. What are essential nodes? They basically have three or more elements connected. Second part, you're gonna select one essential node as a reference ground. That's usually the node uh, connected to the most elements. Number three, you're going to label the remaining essential nodes with a voltage. Don't worry, this might look daunting, but it's not once you do the example. Four, you define the currents entering or leaving each essential node. In terms of node voltages, then you sum the currents and set the sum of the currents equals zero. And then five, you solve the node voltage equations. And that's how you do node voltage. So I'm gonna give you guys an example. Once you get good at it, you don't think of the process behind it at all. I just included that so you guys know the step-by-step -step, uh, way to solve it. So I'm going to draw a circuit here and solve it using the node voltage method. And that's one of the ways you can use in here. So here's the circuits. And what I have for the circuit is um, I have a current source here at this side. And so uh, I have a voltage source here. Uh, wait, give me one second, everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you do for this is you have 10 volts here for a voltage source, and then I'm going to assign a random resistor value, one ohm, a resistor value here, which is five ohms, a resistor value here, which is two ohms, 
going to have 10 ohms here. And for my current source, I'm going to have two amps. And so you'll notice that I have more than one source. That's when I use node voltage. Um, and so I have a voltage source here and I have a current source. And so let's start with number one, find the essential nodes. So it's three or more elements connected. Okay, I'm looking here, voltage source and resistor are connected to this node. That's only two. Here's one resistor, here's another, here's a third, all connected at this point. So here's one. Here's a resistor, here's a resistor, and here's the source. Here's the second essential node. And then um, let's create the ground for the one that's connected to the most. So it's connected to one, two, three, four elements. And so that's where we selected one as a reference ground. Let's label the remaining essential nodes with a voltage. So I'm gonna say this is voltage one here. This is voltage two. And number four, define currents entering or leaving each essential node in terms of node voltages. So what I like to do is I just like to say all of them are leaving. And so um, what I do for V1 to write its equation is I say uh, V1 minus, so it goes from start to finish this line. So V1 minus the next voltage uh, spot, which is this 10 volt. So 10 volts here divided by the resistance, which is one ohm. And then my next arrow, it starts at V1 and it goes down to zero volts. So it's the voltage where it starts, the voltage where it ends. So I'm gonna say V1 minus zero volts all over five ohms and then plus, and then the next one is V1 minus V2 all over two ohms. Starts at the first voltage, V1, and then that arrow goes to V2, the next voltage spot, and then divide by two ohms. And then uh, that gives me all the currents. Voltage divided by resistance gives you current. So uh, I just set it equal to zero because all the currents going um, out is going to be equal to zero here. And so, then my next equation, which is V2 here, I'm just going to draw the currents going out from this node. And so there's nothing coming in. So that's why you set it equal to zero. So V2 here is going to be V2 minus V1 over two plus V2 and V2, this bottom arrow here, it goes to zero volts which is ground, so V2 minus zero volts divided by 10 ohms plus, and then our next one is gonna be V2, but then we have a current source here. So that gives us the current already, because if we notice we are taking all the voltage and dividing it by the resistance to get current. So what we notice here is we have a current going in this direction. So it's opposite to the arrow. So we're gonna give it a negative sign minus two amps because the current's going in the opposite direction and set that equal to zero. And so uh, what you do now is you just simplify these equations. So when I simplify the first one, what I'm going to get is uh, 17 V1 and then minus five V2 is set equal to 100. And then for the next equation, I'm going to get uh, negative 5v1 and then uh, plus 6v2 is going to be equal to 20. So after you simplify and get the voltages, so v1, v2 here on the left-hand side and get your constants on the right, you notice you can either form a matrix or you can use substitution in, uh, in one equation solve for V1 by itself and then plug it into the next. So what you get as a result here, just so you guys um, can check your work, I'm gonna plug it real quick into my calculator and you guys can do it a different way. So what I like to do is I set up a matrix of the coefficients. So I have the 17, negative five, negative five and six. And then I take the inverse and then you do the constants, which is 100 and 20. And you set that equal to what you don't know, which is the V1 and V2. So those are the variables in the center of the equation. 
And so I do this. So when I set up this here, when I go to my calculator and I plug these in, what I'm going to get is, sorry, give me a little time, just plug all those values in. Uh, I plug in 17, negative five, negative five, six, and then I create, uh, do the inverse of that and then create another matrix, which is two by one. And I put in my values 120. And when I hit enter for V1, I get 9.09 .09 volts. And for V2, I'm going to get, oh, sorry, <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> um, V2 here, I'm going to get the value of 10.9 volts. And so that's how you use node voltage. It's one method when you have multiple sources in a circuit. The next one would be the mesh currents method. And for mesh currents, that's a little different, um, but some people like it. So it's just another style. So you guys know how to do it. And so I'm going to give you uh, the steps first, and then I'm going to walk you through it. So mesh currents, the first um, step is you find the meshes. Probably wondering what's a mesh? A mesh is basically a closed loop with no other loops contained within it. And after you find the meshes, you label each mesh with a named current. And then you add the voltages in each mesh algebraically while defining the voltage drops in the resistors in terms of the mesh currents. And then uh, what you do after is you're going to solve using a matrix or substitution if possible. And then you're going to, uh, you can double check by substituting it. Substitute and you can double check. Okay, so let me draw a circuit here and show you how you do mesh currents. So mesh currents, uh, you can have multiple sources. So it's uh, another approach. I'm gonna have a voltage source on this side and I'm going to have a resistor here, resistor here. And you're going to have another one here, another one, and then a third one. And you're going to have another source here. I'm going to just create another voltage source. Let's give these values. I'm going to label this 40 volts here. This will be 20 volts. Up here, we're going to have two ohms. We're going to have eight ohms, six ohms. We're going to have six ohms. And then here we're going to have four ohms. OK, so for meshes, uh, what we do to find the meshes from step number one, a mesh is a closed loop, and it has no other loops in it. So I'm going to call this I1. And then here I'm going to create another mesh, I2. And then here I'm going to create my final mesh, I3. There can be no other loops in this. Um, there's no other ones you can do in I1, no other ones in I2, no other ones in I3. A wrong example would be loop here. Oh, I created a mesh. Well, you can put other loops inside it. So that's not a mesh. OK, we labeled each mesh with a name current, I1, I2, and I3. Now we need to add the voltages in each mesh algebraically. So what that means is we're going to say, I1, uh, we're going to go through. So from top to bottom here through this loop. So I1 times 2 ohms. So I'm going to do I1 times 2 ohms plus, and then we're going to have I1 going for this 8 ohm, but I2 is coming up through the 8 ohm. So you got to be careful. You have to do I1's going through, but I2's going in the opposite direction. So I'm going to assign that a negative. 
times the eight ohm. And then uh, the voltage on the source, we know the current is going, the current is basically going up a voltage rise. So it's going to produce a, a negative, it would, for power. So what I'd like to do is I just write the negative 40 equal to zero. He is, uh, it's in a closed loop. So that's why we can set it equal to zero. And that's how I'm going to write the I1 mesh. So it's all the voltages. So the current times the resistance gives you voltage. So we do with the voltage across the first resistor, which is the two ohm, the voltage across the eight ohm, and then the voltage source, we can just write the voltage in there. Okay, for I2, let's write this equation. I2 is going to be uh, the voltage across the six ohm resistor up there to start out with. So I2 times six ohms plus, and then I'm going to have I2 going through and I3 coming up. So uh, remember I2 and then minus I3 because I2 is actually going down that resistor where I3 is coming up times the six ohm. And then uh, plus, and then here we're going to have I2 coming through up it, um, but I1 is going to be going in the opposite direction. So it's going to be I2 minus I1 times 8 ohms and set that equal to zero. And then for the final one here, what we're going to have is uh, for I3, because we have three meshes, we need three equations. We're going to have um, I3 going for the four ohm resistor. And then we have a voltage source. We notice the current's traveling in a voltage drop. So that's why it's gonna be positive this voltage, so plus 20 volts, and then plus, and then I3, the current's going to go through the 6 ohm resistor, and we're going to set that, uh, oh, but remember, I2 is coming down, so minus I2, because it's going in the opposite direction of the loop we're interested in right now, so times 6 ohms is equal to zero. What you do is you simplify these, and when I simplify, um, what I'm going to want to do is basically I'm going to put all the coefficients for I1. So the I1 from this equation, uh, the I1 from this equation, and the I1, uh, we don't have any in the last equation, so we'll see it'd be zero. So the I1 in the first equation, when you simplify, should be 10, the coefficient in front of it. And then it should be negative eight for that I2 mesh in zero and I3 since there's no I1. So those are the coefficients. Then you put the coefficients of I2, which is negative eight. Uh, then you have 20 and then you have negative six. And then for the coefficients of I3, you're going to have none in the first one. You're going to have um, minus six in the second mesh and 10 in the third mesh. Then you're gonna take the inverse and then multiply that by your constants that you'll get on the right hand side, which you'll get when you simplify 40, 0, and negative 20. And then you're going to set that equal to the unknown variables in the equation. So since our first column was I1, that's going to be in our first row. And the second column was I2, second row. And then in the third column is uh, going to be I3. So that's in the third row here for my unknowns. And then you plug this in to a matrix. And so I need a three by three. So on my calculator, I create a three by three matrix. And I do 10, negative eight, zero, and then negative eight, 20, negative six, and then zero, negative six, and 10, and then raise that to the negative one, since it's the inverse of the coefficients, then times the constants you'll get on the right hand side, which is 40, 0, and negative 20. And when I put that equal for I1, I get 5.6 volt, or sorry, 5.6 amps. For I2, I get 2 amps. And for I3, I get negative 0 0.8 amps. And that's how you use the mesh current method. And those will be the most uh, common two 
for um, multiple sources in a circuit, what you use to solve for them. And so I'm going to end the presentation there today. Hopefully you guys had a fun time reviewing all this or learning something new and I'll post the recording. So I'm gonna stop it right now and I can answer